NIDA stands for uh, No Evidence of Disease Activity, the composite measure takes into account relapses, disability progression, MRI activity. Uh, you've shown that a higher proportion of patients uh, with active relapsing MS achieve NIDA after Mavenclad treatment compared to those on placebo. Can you tell us more about these results as achieving of NIDA and put them in perspective for patients? Yeah, so NIDA is no event disease activity. This is a new therapeutic concept. Um, it's not unique to, it's not new in the sense that we've stolen it from oncology where you treat to no evidence of detectable disease. Uh, and so the idea is to try and create a target of treatment and is trying to suppress as much disease activity as possible. And it's going to mature over time as new technologies emerge. And so uh, what we try and look at in terms of uh, drug effectiveness or relative effectiveness uh, is how good a dr is a drug at rendering a population of patients neater. And so uh, oral cladribine uh, was close to 50% versus, versus uh, placebo, um, uh, which was region about 16 to 17%. So the relative, uh, um, the, you know, the relative chance of being neater is about three and a half times greater on, on uh, uh, cladribine versus placebo. But that's kind of a flawed comparison because we use the baseline scan in that versus the two-year scan. And so people will, we will, people who have activity in the first few months before the treatment works get counted as being NIDA when actually the drug takes a bit of time to work. So the new rendition of NIDA is going to be re-baselining. And so we are going to be we're doing that analysis right now. And so 47% is actually very, very good com two years compared to baseline. I think it's going to get much, much better when we go from two years versus uh, with, with six months uh, re-baseline. And, and so um, I, I think that's going to put uh, oral cladribine in the, the very high efficacy bracket as a very effective therapy at giving people a chance of being uh, activity-free, you know, stopping them having any relapses or more activity. The test didn't actually, the trial, of course, didn't actually compare this, but do you have a sense for how this might compare to other highly effective MS drugs, uh, MS therapies, uh, say infusion therapies, uh, those that are also highly effective at, at bringing about NIDA? Well, I think um, based on just the absolute NIDA rates, it's in the same ballpark as therapies like alemtuzumab. It's in the same ballpark as uh, treatments like uh, natalizumab. But now I'm not saying it's going to be as effective as those. I'm saying it's going to be in that range of the high efficacy treatments. We would need to do head-to-head -head comparisons. Uh, one of the metrics we also look at is the effect on brain atrophy, brain shrinkage. Right. And so uh, cladribine, although it reduced brain shrinkage, it didn't bring it down, in my opinion, into the same um, uh, zone of 0.2%, for example, as like some of the other more effective, in brackets, more effective treatments. However, the effect on brain atrophy can take time to emerge. Sometimes you've got to look in years three, four, and, and on. So we, I'm, I'm very keen, I'd be very interested to see what happens to brain volume loss in cladribine cohorts uh, into years three and four, and if it normalizes brain atrophy rates. Because that's also one of the metrics that separates the very high efficacy treatments from the less than high efficacy treatments. But there's no doubt based on its impact in high, highly active patients, mm -hmm. its impact on NIDA, that it's in the highly effective, maybe not quite in the very highly effective uh, was it, group. Was activity seen also perhaps in those with less, less active disease? You yes, know, no, it worked across all components. It's just that it was more effective compared to placebo in the very high. And that's driven by the activity really in the placebo arm. So what you've got to realize is when you select a more active population, you're going to have more activity right. in the comparator arm. So the relative benefit goes up. It's still effective uh, in the uh, less active group, it's just that the comparison is not quite the same. So, the so, we, so we see this with all therapies. When you start enriching for more active patients, you get a much bigger treatment response simply because you get more events in the placebo arm. It's just a, it's a pseudo signal in a sense. It just means that the, the drug is still effective. It is effective across the general MS yeah, population. Yeah. I, I say general. We haven't tested it in uh, a large enough people with progressive, more advanced MS. But I suspect if the trials were done properly, it would be effective in progressive MS as well. Are cross plan for progressive? Uh... Well, we want to do one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I try to lobby. Uh, we're trying to lobby Merck to do one in progressive MS. I think we now know that if you power progressive trials large enough, um, using the right outcome measures, and you can do it to a time to event study, like it's been done with ocrelizumab and saponamide, 
um, you're much like more likely to get a positive trial. Thank you. How clini clinically meaningful is reduction in MRI detected lesions in treated patients in the clinic? clinical meaningfulness of this? Uh, I think it is because the opposite is, is very important. So people who don't become neater, who have activity, they do much worse. Uh, and you know, people still say, well, show me the data, but it's pretty evident from all the, all the phase three programs and even in some real life data sets that people who have ongoing inflammatory activity do much worse in the long term. So uh, it's just a way of monitoring MS uh, with, with technology. Uh, you know, in the past we used to rely on just clinical attacks and that's about one-tenth of the activity. So for every attack, there are ten or more lesions that are coming and going. And so we know that those lesions are causing damage. So it's just a, a, a way of detecting who's a non-responder much quicker or who needs to be treated much quicker. So for cladribine, because it's an immune reconstitution therapy, um, it works, the philosophy is slightly different, but what you do is you put people into remission, and if you get activity coming back, it's an indication to retreat them doesn't mean to say you failed a therapy. This is the thing about immune reconstitution therapies, is that by monitoring them and you're seeing activity come back, that's often an indication to retreat. Whereas if you're on a maintenance treatment all along, continuously, that means you've got a suboptimal response, and that means you've got to be switched or escalated. Uh, lymphopenia, phenia, and I know I'm missing that, net, lymphopenia? Lymphopenia. Uh, lymphopenia, <laughs> thank you. Uh, is, a new, is usually the most common adverse effect of a magnified treatment, and that's consistent with its mechanism of action. Did you observe this problem, this, this uh, low white box account in your uh, studies? Yeah, so lymphopenia is how the drug works. It works right. by killing lymphocytes right. and then allowing them to repopulate with a different population. Uh, hopefully the population that comes back are not uh, autoimmune. It's, so it's pretty effective at reducing lymphocyte counts, but it does it differentially. It takes the B lymphocytes down much lower than the T lymphocytes. Uh, and some patients are left with what we call low lymphocyte counts. Um, however, we actually did notice that uh, if you retreated before people's counts got back towards normal, above 800, you're much more likely to develop what we call grade 4 lymphopenia, which is below 200. And uh, that level is significant because the lower your lymphocyte counts are, particularly below 200, the more at risk you are of opportunistic infections. So I think when the drug is launched and in the real world, we'll get much, much lower risk of uh, grade 3 and grade 4 because we're going to be modifying the dosing. So we did the clarity. We didn't have that in the protocol. So we were just fixed dosing. And I think that idea of fixed dosing uh, is, is, is not what we should be looking at. What we should be doing is if somebody's lymphocyte counts haven't come back to normal or towards normal, just wait three or six months until they have come back, then give the next course. So it's not like you have to give it every fi fixed. You can actually shift when you give the second course. I think, I think the complication of lymphopenia is going to be a much less of an issue in clinical practice. Did the lymphocyte counts come back fairly quickly? To yeah, so um, after the two years of treatment, um, um, by 144 weeks, 75% uh, um, uh, of patients had got to levels above normal. And the others, the levels were outside grade 4 and outside grade 3, so they were in between. So, yes, uh, the lymphopenia is not going to be a big issue clinically. And the, and the risk of infections uh, from lymphopenia, that was really more where, where retreatment was done within... Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the only infection that popped up with lymphopenia um, that was a real signal was uh, herpes zoster, shingles. And um, you know, people who had the worst lymphopenia, grade 3 or grade 4, were at higher risk of zoster, but we also saw it in people who had grade 1 and 2 lymphopenia. So it's, a, it's an issue with almost every immunosuppressive drug you use. You know, you, whatever you use uh, in clinical practice, you can use fingolimab, you can use uh, ocrelizumab, alemtuzumab. We see uh, uh, zoster there. And 90% of the zoster infections were mild or moderate. And we do have strategies to manage that with antivirals, for example. So it's something we just have to live with and get used to managing it. And uh, I hope in the future we can, we can de-risk it. There may be a way of giving a vaccine to EZV uh, prior to using immunosuppressive drugs. And by boosting your immune response, maybe when you have the immunosuppressive drug, you've got more cells that respond to the virus. Mavenclad differs from most other oral MS therapies, and that's a short treatment course. Uh, I think a maximum of 20 days. We're, we're that's that. correct, yeah. Uh, and then, and effects were seen to be triggered and upheld for over two for about two years. 
Um, four which, years. Four years. Because yeah. because what happens is is you give the you give the treatments in year one and year two, and the extension study took them to the end of four years and beyond actually, because there was a bit of a treatment gap in the middle. So it was actually in some patients close to five years. Mm. Which is, is a huge benefit to patients in the fact that you can you have a benefit without yeah. being continuously on medication. Uh, is this, in your opinion, one of the greatest advantages of Mevacod you know, from a patient's perspective compared to other MS treatments that you know, other MS therapies? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's real advantage, first of all, it's an immune reconstitution therapy. So it, it, it tries to get to the cause of MS. Um, it... Uh, is quite selective in the way it depletes cells. It hits T and B lymphocytes and leaves the innate intact. And that's important because with drugs that take the innate immune system out, you're at risk of bacterial infections, like Listeria, for example. We see that with Alemtuzumab. You don't get that with Mavencad. Uh, and also, the level of T cell depletion is not that great, so you don't see that many opportunistic infections. And, so, and also, the, the rate of killing, it doesn't just blast the cells and kills them within a couple of hours. It does it much more slowly. And so... Um, we don't get infusion type reactions, so the big advantages. And the other advantage of uh, cladribine is that it's out the system very quickly. It's it's uh, in the circulation for a few hours and out the body within about a week. And so obviously, if you're a woman who wants to start or extend a family, knowing that the drugs out of your system uh, is quite reassuring. You can fall pregnant, knowing that you're not going to expose the baby to a teratogen or potential teratogen. You may not be able to a answer this at all as a researcher, but I'll throw it anyway. <laughs> Mavenclad, of course, is, is approved in the European Union. Have you, do you know of plans to have it approved in the United States? I think, I think the company mentioned today at a press meeting they would like to get it approved across the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, there are no specific plans, um, but I, uh, I would hope they would um, address the uh, uh, US market because it's going to be in Canada. And we've had this problem when Lentrada was uh, licensed in Europe, not in the United States. We had a lot of tourism. So my colleague in private practice treated with seven or eight Americans who came to London for their treatment. And they then needed monitoring. They had to go back to their neurologist. And the neurologist was saying, why should I be doing, taking all the risks of the monitoring and the patients being treated in the UK? So there are those issues of tourism. Uh, it may or may not happen for Cladribe. You know. I've already had a request for a postal service to a patient yeah. abroad who can't get access right now to cladribine would want it. So, uh, so, I mean, people are very proactive about their treatments. Yeah. So that may happen. Excellent. Uh, is there anything else you would like, any other points you would like to bring up or anything you would like to discuss, further clarify? No, I just think what you need to highlight in, I'd like to highlight is how clever this drug is. It's a, you know, d due to a quirk in biology, it was discovered. And um, um, it's really quite a smart smart therapy because it targets the T and B lymphocytes pretty selectively and leaving out the other innate and that's what's clever about it. It's like a chemical monoclonal antibody in, the, in a way because it's taking out um, a population of cells that we think of drive MS and leaving the rest of the immune system relatively intact so it's got quite a unique profile uh, compared to the other agents in that space. And you think it has potential to have, it clearly has potential for collapsing but you think it has a potential for progressive as well? Oh yes. I think, I think we could have had treatments for progressive MS decades ago if only we knew how to do the trials properly. Now that we know how to do the trials properly, we will get treatment. But the treatments in, MA, in progressive MS are not going to be that effective. They're going to be a small effect because they've already lost a lot of nerve cells. So we're going to have to work on treatments to add on top of that, like neuroprotective drugs, remyelination, restorative therapies, etc. Thank you very much. <laughs>